Hello, and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest today is Michael Madison, Professor of Law at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. We will be discussing his articles, The End of the Work as We Know It, and Creativity and Craft. So, hello, Mike. Hi. <laughs> so, it's great to talk to you. Um, I, I've been a fan of your work for a long time, and I, I really enjoyed reading both of these articles, which I think have a deep connection to each other, which I, I want to get into, obviously, as we continue our conversation. But I was wondering if we could start by you just explaining a couple of the kind of copyright-specific terms that I think are at the core of both of these articles and why they're important. So maybe we could start with your um, your REM-themed paper uh, about the end of, of the work. And you could say a little something about like what is a work in a copyright context and, and why does it matter? So I'll give the answer that the law gives us, which is that copyright law is a system of exclusive legal rights that the author of a creative work or what the law calls an original work of authorship gets. So if you write a song or a book or make a film or write a computer program, the usual understanding is that that creative thing is called a work, both as a matter of art practice, but also as a matter of legal terminology. And then the owner of that work gets the legal rights to prevent other people from making unauthorized copies or selling unauthorized copies, performing the work without permission and so forth. But all of the legal rights that is, are associated with creating something are legal rights that are connected to this thing we call a work of authorship or a work. Okay. So in your paper, you talk about the end of the work. And I think people have kind of a, a colloquial sense of what a work is a kind of in a, in a kind of a tangible sense of the thing that they experience, which of course we'll, we'll get into further, I think in relation to, to your other paper, but, but why do you think the work or the concept of a work is a difficult or contested content concept in a, in a copyright context? It's a puzzling concept for a bunch of related reasons, and that's what prompted me to write the paper. It's a puzzling concept because if you simply look at the text of the law and simply look at the text of a lot of different judicial opinions that are trying to make sense of this part of the law, the work gives off the sense that it's a very simple concept, that it's a concept that's very easy to understand and apply, whether you're a lawyer or a non-lawyer. But the, when you start to get into how it works on the ground, when you start to look carefully at what courts are doing with the concept, when you start looking at some of the history of copyright law and how copyright law has changed, and also you start looking at gaps between how the legal system uses this terminology and how various art worlds or creative worlds use that terminology, you start to pick up a lot of uncertainty and ambiguity and change. And so it's a concept that looks very stable and easy to understand, but you stare at it a little bit and it turns into something that's kind of murky and fluid and evolving. And you start wondering what's really going on here. Okay. So maybe you could talk a little more concretely about some of those kind of specific tensions. Like, for example, when we talk about a book, what's the work? So answering the question in the context of a book, it's a very easy standard copyright case, gives you a pretty quick head start on why what seems like an easy concept potentially is a difficult concept. So there's one sense in which you hold a book and the book itself is the work. It could be the text, 
It could be the creative thinking, plot, character, setting, uh, attributes that sort of shape the text. Uh, it could be the physical object in the form of a classical paper produced material object. So those are all attributes that sort of connect to each other. So the text is obviously connected to the plot, characters, dialogue, setting, and those things traditionally were connected to the physical object that you held in your hand. But just as a matter of ordinary daily experience, those are three slightly different characterizations of what the work would be. In copyright terms, there's an additional characterization. And again, that legal characterization of the book has some ambiguity or flexibility. So in copyright terms, the work is usually thought to be the author's creative contribution. Mm. And the more specific and detailed we're talking, the more obviously it is creative contribution by the author. So the specifics of the plot, the specifics of the dialogue, the specifics of the characters, attributes and histories, those are all details that only the author was responsible for. So when you add up those details, that creative contribution is characterized legally as the work. The idea, sort of the general instinct that motivated the author, that's not quite so specifically associated with that author. So that's much less likely to be characterized legally as the work. Right? So copyright focuses on the details of the expression of the particular thing rather than the general aura or idea. Right, right. Okay. So in, in your paper, you, you focus on a number of different examples where the concept of the work becomes kind of the core contested issue in kind of particular disputes, particular copyright disputes. And uh, I'd be happy to talk about a bunch of them, but the one that really struck me, the one that I thought was really central to the paper was your discussion of the Chapman Kelly case. And maybe we could talk a little bit about, you know, why you thought the concept of the work was important in that context. Yeah. So uh, maybe I should briefly give an overview of the case itself. Definitely. Cause the facts are fantastic. Yeah. I, I love this case. A lot of copyright scholars love this case. Um, it, you know, my, my style of legal scholarship often is motivated by, discovering a particularly provocative and complex fact pattern or lawsuit and using that as kind of an entree to bigger topics. And that's definitely uh, the case here. The, the Chapman Kelly case definitely got my mind thinking about the themes in that case and how they scale up to bigger problems in art and law generally. So the basic conflict in the Chapman Kelly case is you have an artist, and I think it's absolutely fair and appropriate to call him an artist, Chapman mm -hmm. Kelly, uh, who is trained as an MFA, but who over the course of his career had come to express his art in landscape design. Uh, and so he had been commissioned by a public entity in Chicago, the Parks District, which is part of the government apparatus up in Chicago, to design and redesign uh, a big public park. Uh, and so Kelly executed, uh, came up with and then executed a very elaborate design involving hardscape and also involving uh, plantings and floral patterns. Uh, so he characterizes his work as painting with flowers uh, mm -hmm. because of how he adapted the, the, the planting and growing patterns and the seasons and the types of flowers and so forth that were in part, different parts of the, of the garden. Uh, right. Over time, uh, you know, there, there was an agreement between the, the uh, public authority and Chapman Kelly to maintain the design in place and to sort of tend to it and make sure that it continued to uh, continue to thrive. Um, eventually, after a period of time, the uh, the Parks District decided to make some changes and decided that uh, in sort of the natural evolution of the life of a public space, that what had been planted and designed in the first place did not continue to serve the needs and goals of the park district. So they proposed some changes uh, and Chapman Kelly, the original designer objected. 
and the the crux of the dispute is that he regarded his artistic design for the park as a copyrightable work of his artistic expression, and mm -hmm. in his uh, in his way of uh, arguing the case, uh, that meant that he was entitled legally by copyright law to prevent the park district from making changes to his artwork without his permission. So in the language of copyright law, the, the parks district was going to produce an unauthorized derivative work, an unauthorized adaptation. Uh, and so that gets us into some details of the Copyright Act. But the basic idea is that the artist did not want the owner of the artwork to make changes without the artist's permission. Right. So this goes to federal court. Uh, and eventually the conflict makes its way to the Federal Court of Appeals, the Seventh Circuit, which sits in Chicago. And uh, to strip away some of the details of the statutory claims, in effect, Chapman Kelly loses the case. But what is interesting about the case, what's fascinating about the case is not the outcome so much. What's fascinating is the way the court decided the case, how the court reasoned through the meaning of copyright law, the application of copyright law to what Chapman Kelly had produced, and then eventually the justification for denying uh, Chapman, Chapman Kelly's claim to basically stop anyone from making changes. So here's, here's the, the basics of it. The court says that a garden cannot be copyrighted. And it cannot be copyrighted, says the court, because a garden is not a fixed thing. So the, the, the quick background here is that American copyright law only protects creative artwork so long as that creative artwork is fixed in some tangible form. So you use the case of a book. A book is obviously traditionally in some fixed form. It's got binding, it's got printed pages, it's got ink, it's got paper, it's something you can hold in your hand. You might think a garden has a fixed fixed form. You can yeah. pick up the flowers, you can pick up the dirt, you can pick up the grass, you can touch the hardscape. But the court says, wait a minute, gardens change from season to season. Things grow, things die back, things bloom, etc. A garden is a living thing. A garden is by definition a natural collection. And natural collections evolve with the influence of the sun and the wind and the rain and, and other things. So um, I'll just let it sit there for a moment and let you follow up. But that's just an absolutely fascinating way for anyone to think about something that is created the way that a, a natural landscape we now know is created. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I remember correctly, right, this was a piece called Wildflower Works yeah. that Chapman Kelly made. And my recollection is it was like two giant ovals of plantings that he sort of had people maintaining. And then the city, after like over a decade, it was quite a long period of time, wanted to kind of change the shape and make them smaller, et cetera, and add, maybe add some like stuff that he didn't think should be there. And that's what he objected to. And, and I think one of the interesting things about the case is that, as you suggest, it seems like a foregone conclusion that the city was going to win, right? I mean, there, there's no way that the court was going to say Chapman Kelly gets to have his garden on the lakefront in Chicago forever in perpetuity, whether or not the city of Chicago wants it to still be there. And it seems like part of the, the, the problem was how does the court get there? And it sounds like it was using the concept of the work in a way that is conceptually troubling because, you know, the way you describe the court's reasoning, like on its surface, it's like, well, it's true that a, a garden changes over time, but, but everything we think of as a work has the potential to change over time too. Right. Right. So it, it was the particular aspects of the change, I think, that the court seemed to be relying on here. Partly the court said so directly, in part, I think the court was relying on some unstated assumptions. To me, in this case, there was a big distinction in the court's judgment between human-created artifacts, 
Mm -hmm. Those are artworks. And natural process or natural phenomena, which is, Mm. it's a an antiquated classic division in the world, the line between what is sort of natural versus what is human-made or man-made. And the court just bought it almost without critique, even though both in the scientific world, in the cultural world, in the modern legal world, the line between what is human and what is man-made or human-made even with respect to gardens and landscaping, is very, very blurry. Right. 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 Um, so, so and it, seems, it seems, sorry. I was going to say, it just, the court seemed to be saying, it's a garden, therefore it cannot be copyrighted, as if to say you can't copyright the sun or a meadow or something equally, obviously natural. Right. And it seems like, Maybe part of the problem here is the court's failure to distinguish I mean, one part of the problem anyway is the court's failure to distinguish between the garden and the concept of the garden, in other words, is it even right to say that the garden itself was the work in the first place, or where is the work in this context so it depends on who you ask, so I think. The way you've teed up the question illustrates the problems with it, because in kind of classic copyright law terms, the work would consist of the sort of the concept and the details of its execution that the artist and creator has come up with before there is a spade of dirt turned or plants planted, that there is some sort of, there is some intangible design that has been shaped to a level of specificity in the mind and maybe in the hand of the creator, in this case, Chapman Kelly. And then step two, a group of people go out and actually build it or paint it. I mean, so there's an equivalence here between uh, we'll say Chapman Kelly coming up with the design for a, a landscape and somebody executing the landscape and a something that's more recognizably artistic in a classic sense, uh, say Jeff Koons coming up with a, a design for a conceptual work of art and then uh, a, a, a group of, of craftspeople and laborers that Jeff Koons has hired and supervises to actually execute the thing that the artist, Jeff Koons, has come up with, right? So in the art world, the more conventional art world, there's lots and lots of examples of people sort of dividing the creative activity, which is copyrightable, from the physical Mm -hmm. execution of that creative activity, which is ordinary physical property, but it's not copyrighted property. And so when you apply that sort of conceptual two-step, right, creation of a copyrightable intangible concept versus execution of a material thing. You apply that framework to a landscape design, it becomes very, very fragile. And the, uh, and the court is using this label, the work as a copyright term to kind of sort of hide all of the complexity. It, it takes mm. the complexity of the development and implementation of a very, very, um, unorthodox artistic product, and it hides the complexity of that unorthodox product behind a much more orthodox two-stage design execution copyright process. All right. So, you know, if you study the history of landscape design, you know that lots of very, very well-known naturalistic landscapes are actually very heavily human produced things. So take mm-hmm. take uh, Central Park in New York City or Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. Take a lot of the extremely well-known, big, very naturalistic uh, uh, gardens associated with big estates in England that give every outward appearance of being absolutely just the way the world emerged and grew whether it was through wind and sun or the, the legacy of glaciers or what have you. But in fact, 
we know that Central Park and Golden Gate Park were heavily sculpted under the direction of Frederick Law Olmsted. The, the English sort of naturalistic garden tradition is very heavily associated with a wonderful guy named Capability Brown. Right, so, <laughs> which everybody it's an encyc- it's a, is that Encyclopedia's brother, uh, something like that. It's, it's a fabulous name, um, but the point is that within the world of landscape design and gardening, if you talk to people who are experts in those areas, they would say, and they often did say, in connection with this Chapman Kelly lawsuit, that it's completely ridiculous and disrespectful to treat people who are creators in the gardening and landscape design world as if they are doing nothing more than planting things. That in Mm -hmm. fact, they are creative people just as much as a painter or a novelist or a poet. Um, In the lawsuit, what, what the court really doesn't get is that creative practice has a lot of different forms and a lot of different styles. But copyright law dictates that copyright has to fit in certain packages. And the copyright package is this word, the work. So there's this mismatch between what's going out, go, going on in the world of creativity and the world of legal forms. Right. So if I may, I mean, it seems like the, one of the fascinating things about this case is that On its face, it looks like a kind of doctrinal mistake by the court, like misapplying the concept of the work in this sort of marginal context. But it sounds like, it seems to me that you're identifying in a way in which it's actually kind of illuminating this deep rupture in copyright law, like this fundamental problem with our attempt to articulate what a work is in the first place. Um, and I was wondering if you could just say a little something about, you know, how you think that that rupture affects sort of our concept of the work or how we we're trying to understand it. I mean, you're, you're, you know, you, you, you characterize your paper as descriptive, but it's describing something very troubling. It's like there's a, a presence of, of, absence, in a sense, in the paper itself. The the brooding omnipresence of absence. Um, I think that's right. I think that, that, that I have this instinct that there is something deeply problematic about the structures of the legal system here. Um, and that the, this, this complexity or omission with respect to how to define or capture the work is emblematic of a much deeper mismatch between what the law is trying to do and what people experience in the world. Um, and I, and I, all of the things I've written in different contexts over the last dozen years or 15 years are in different ways, expressions of discomfort with this sort of law versus culture mismatch. Um, so the Peter Drucker, I don't know if you know Peter Drucker, right? So a famous mm-hmm. management guru, Peter Drucker had a saying and the saying was, Culture eats strategy for breakfast. <laughs> and th- you can, I can sort of adapt that saying as a way of, of expressing the same sensibility in, this, in the following way. Culture eats law for breakfast. So, mm. you know, lawyers and legal scholars spend a lot of time navigating the nuances of legal doctrine and courts that get decisions wrong or right or statutes that need to be tweaked to be a little bit more sensible. And my basic instinct is that you can tweak all of those legal doctrinal points you want, but you're not really going to make the world a better place until you have a really deep understanding of big cultural forces that are at work that you might or might not be able to move by tweaking bits and pieces of the law. Uh, so I think that's the, the, the large scale instinct that's at work here. We've got a court that, as you said, really doesn't want to tell the city of Chicago that it can't change the garden. It doesn't have a good set of levers in copyright law to express that sensibility, right? It's got the ideas of authorship, right? Copyright says authors have rights. Well, Unfortunately, copyright law does not give us a good, clear working definition of who an author is. 
Copyright law says copyrightable things need to be fixed. Again, we don't have a good, consistent, workable de definition of what fixation is. And outside of the US, copyright carries on without that element. Fixation is a part of US copyright law, but not really a part of copyright law in most other countries. So we've got the author author concept. That's not very good here for Chapman Kelly. We've got fixation. That's also an awkward concept. And we've got this concept of the work in copyright, which has no given definition. So the, so the court sort of has to come up with an explanation of why Chapman Kelly loses. It's got no good options in terms of the classic tools of copyright law. So it picks one and it, it picks one that, you know, it's going to talk about fixation. It could have talked about authorship, could have talked more directly about the work. What I think is really going on is that this is not the sort of thing. A garden is not the sort of thing that the court thinks should be governed by copyright law. And I want to sort of, in the paper, sort of tease that out and say, well, there's a much bigger omission in the law that is exposed. And that omission is we really still after centuries don't have a good sensible understanding of the relationship between big cultural practices and legal doctrine. Yeah. So I was going to say the, the paper reminded me of one of my favorite philosophers. That's uh, Chauncey Gardner from being there. <laughs> um, and he said, uh, as long as the roots are not severed, all is well all will be well in the garden. And I just couldn't help but think that like yeah, the roots have been severed, you know? I mean... Then the roots were very <laughs> shallow to begin with. Um, you know, it, it, it's inter one of the interesting things, one of the many fascinating things about copyright law is that it's got a history that goes back 300 years, more than 300 years. Mm. And we're still sitting here in the early 21st century arguing about some very fundamental concepts mm. about where it comes from and why we do it and how it works. So true. So true. And I think that that's a great segue actually into your other paper, um, uh, Creativity and Craft, where you, you really get at in a, in a, in a much more detailed way, the same kind of conceptual problem that you were just talking about in relation to the kind of work that Chapman Kelly is doing. So I was wondering if you, you could say a little bit about just briefly, like, why you think the concept of creativity matters to our kind of copyright doctrine and the, the problem that you expose in that paper about sort of creativity in kind of how it's applied in tangible form. Sure. So the first thing to note is that that word creativity and the concept that goes with the word is a very modern word. It's a very 20th century word. Um, 19th century philosophers and historians of art and people before that, they didn't really have a vocabulary or a conceptual syntax that identified creativity as a, as a thing or as a practice. Uh, people were creative, but creativity was really waiting to be developed. It developed over the course of the 20th century, uh, partly in the law and partly in the art world, as a way of trying to sort of define the boundary of um, sort of relevant critical practice and relevant legal judgment. So what separates copyright from patent when both have mm. to do with recognizing and motivating and rewarding people who create new things. So patent is more associated with technology and science. Copyright is more associated with art and culture. Eventually, the courts settle on this concept of creativity as sort of defining the boundaries of copyright. So creative, creativity and copyright go together and invention and patents go together. And that's a way of defining the relevant spaces. Uh, the problem with doing that is that it puts a lot of stress on coming up with a workable doctrine or idea of creativity. 
What is creativity? Mm. Who is creative? What counts as creative for copyright purposes and what doesn't count as creative for copyright purposes? And there's a huge literature out there in psychology and another huge literature out there in sociology and in history and philosophy and now law trying to wrestle with what do we mean when we say creative or creativity? And inevitably, some things get included and some things get excluded. In law, what's interesting is that this idea of creativity links up with this idea of the work, right? So creativity in copyright law comes to be very focused on objects, conceptual objects, material objects, but in either case, things. And it's worth pointing that out because psychology, other social, social scientists tend to associate creativity with dynamism and flow and mm. sort of collective understanding. So groups of people interacting with each other, ideas, concepts, expressions are kind of meandering in and out as patterns. And eventually you, you sort of dip your toe into the flowing stream and you pull something out, but the stream of flow is as important as the objects you pull out. In copyright, it tends to be the reverse. In copyright, it tends to focus on the form or the object. And we tend to push the flow or the background pattern off to the side. Um, and, and the point of this paper is to say, let's recognize that judgment in copyright, not only for what it for what we know that it does, because we know that making that judgment in copyright has concrete implications in economic terms. People who make fixed things like books, music, films, get a kind of copyright reward and privilege because they get legal rights. Mm -hmm. And people who work in more improvisatory forms like jazz, for example, or or uh, slam poetry, or, or there's all kinds of forms of, of creative art that are not easily reducible to fixed things, they lose out. They don't get legal rights because of the way that- Or, or, guard, or gardens. Or gardens, that. right. No, guard, this is the link right, that you've identified. Um, so the paper says, well, let's take that one step farther because that observation about economic judgments is pretty well established. The, the additional observation that I was interested in introducing is the idea that there's a kind of moral or ethical character to this that there is a very, very long and antique philosophical tradition, ethical tradition that says working with your mind is in a ethical sense better than working with your hands. And then there's kind of a countervailing philosophical tradition, again, that goes all the way back to ancient Greece that says, wait, no, they're sort of on a par with each other. We can characterize them in slightly different things, but people who work with their hands are just as ethically valued as people who work with their minds. So, uh, you know, in copyright law today, there's a big controversy that continues between should we be prioritizing economic logic and economic arguments and structuring legal analysis, or should we be highlighting ethical or moral arguments about legal analysis. So do we give legal rights to authors because authors need them to motivate them uh, via the profit motive? Or do we give rights to authors because authors are morally deserving people? They have created things that are socially worthwhile and they've kind of earned a legal status via copyright. So that, that economics versus moral logic is pretty well established. My point in this paper is to say there's a whole nother layer of the ethical argument here because mm. we take people who really work in craft traditions, in, in art worlds, um, sculptors, but also people who are making things, they talk about them making things. We don't think of them as craft workers in a classic sense. So people who are photographers talk about making photographs, right? That's a rhetorical move because it reflects the fact that people who are making almost you know, at this point, classically creative things really are working in a craft tradition, right? The, the, the mechanics of producing something matter and they matter within that cultural practice. Um, you know, you and I write law review articles and other scholarship. Uh, it's entirely plausible and reasonable to talk about writing something as a craft practice. Right. And so, of course, people who are professional writers talk all the time about the craft of writing. Right. But 
the, the point of this paper is that that style of talking and that style of thinking, which has clear ethical dimensions, is completely excluded by the logic of copyright. Yeah. Yeah. And I was, I was really taken with the way you used this kind of Aristotelian distinction between techne and poesis to get at like the different forms of, um, engagement with the world and of creation. I was wondering if you could say a little something about that, maybe. Well, I can say only so much that I'm confident I won't get myself into trouble because I'm not <laughs> I'm by no means an expert in ancient Greek philosophy. Um, so, yeah, so I, the point of the references to Aristotle and to Technia and Poesis, and, and I don't in the paper talk about episteme, but that, that's in the operating in the background there as well, I think, um, is that the ancient Greeks had a system for identifying distinct ways of knowing the world, right? So in some respects, the Greek tradition is completely antithetical to the way we think about the world now, because the Greeks, to paint with an enormously broad brush, thought about the world as essentially unchanging. So, mm. you know, knowledge about the world was essentially a fixed thing. And there was a certain practice associated with figuring that out. And then there was a separate practice associated with sort of representing it in objects. The difference, of course, is today we understand that the of, processes of knowledge acquisition are always evolving and dynamic, that there's more to learn. The world is changing. Our knowledge of the world becomes more sophisticated uh, or uh, we just, you know, Thomas Kuhn paradigm shifts are exposed to us. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got a much more heterogeneous domain of, sort of knowledge and and. Uh, acquisition and practice than the Greeks did. But we we still share some of this these echoes of people, you know, you know, to be very, very blunt about it, people who work in universities are knowledge workers and we are have higher status positions and better income than people who work day to day with their hands, like carpenters and plumbers. Uh, who may in their own domains be incredibly gifted and sophisticated in how they acquire and use knowledge, but they use it in a tangibly expressed way that from a social status and priority and privilege standpoint, you know, they're regarded as sort of lower on the collective totem pole. Um, back to Chapman Kelly, people who are landscape designers are not given the same sort of ethical status or social status in society that, uh, compared to fancy architects. Uh, so there's kind of a, you know, you build buildings and you're a superstar architect, you're celebrated globally. Mm. If you are uh, a superstar landscape designer, you really have to get to the level of being Frederick Law Olmsted or Capability Brown. And even then, you're, very, you're much more unique and you're probably uh, more celebrated after your career is over uh, than in your own time. Uh, not completely true. Olmsted was really celebrated in his own time. But, but there's a very, very broad brush historical tradition. That's the reason to invoke the Greek example. Right, right. No, that's, I, I, I love that. Um, and so to, to close out the conversation, I wanted to just put a pin in the fact that I really liked the way you tied this tension back to Feist v. Rural, which I think you rightly describe as like, for better or for worse, fundamental to the way we think about the structure of copyright law today and its rejection of the idea of the sweat of the brow of labor, as it were, as being a potential subject matter uh, of creativity. Um, and I was wondering if, if you could just say in a few, like talk a little bit about how you think we should think differently or potentially think differently about the concept of the work and what creativity means to that uh, in relation to those two papers. So I'm usually not great at coming up with pithy single point takeaways for what to do with my 
uh, meanderings around the concepts. I, I do think that one takeaway relative to Feist and relative to these works, these papers and others, is that the world of copyright law and the world of IP law invests way too much time in the search for a kind of holy grail. There is a kind of search for the eternal, absolute, fixed meaning of this concept. What is the work? We obsess about it. Courts focus on it. Authors focus on it. Lawyers talk about it. It's just a colossal mistake to invest too much time in that. It's an unavoidable concept, but it's an unavoidable concept that is useful if people recognize that it depends on context, that it's got flexibility, and that it changes over time rather than it being a kind of ideal or platonic thing. Mm. Yeah, no, that makes that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, well, Mike, thanks so much. It's really been a pleasure talking to you about these two It's papers. a blast. Thanks for the invitation.